We are deep into the throes of a series about friendship with God. And uh, the theme verse, let me read this out of John chapter 15, and then I'll kind of introduce what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, It says this out of John chapter 15. This is Jesus speaking. He said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then he said this, you're my friends if you do what I command. There's that pesky word, if, right? If you do what I command. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. I've read that passage a thousand times. But you know what hit me when I was reading it? This, well, I've had, <laughs> this, this is part six. So I've had like five weeks. I'm going to cram like three weeks of messages into one message, okay? I promise to have you out of here by two. I promise. <laughs> um, but as I was reading this, it, instead, I have called you friends, which always just catches me off guard. But then Jesus said this, for everything, catch that, for everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. And I went, wait, what? Everything? Jesus said, everything that I learned from my Father, I've made made known to you. Very, very powerful. Does anyone else struggle with this concept of Jesus being your friend? I mean, I I know that. I mean, he just said it. I remember growing up in the Church of the Brethren singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer, right? I, you know, we know that, but there's a part of me that just, I, it's easier to wrap my head around him being the, the king of the universe, the Lord, right? My Lord and Savior than my friend. But I love that. If you do what I command. Man, that's such a loaded statement. And I think it's easy for us, if you've been a believer for any length of time, it's easy to take that, that part right there, if you do what I command, and it easily becomes how well I perform. If I'm behaving myself, if I don't kick the dog, not that I ever kick, I don't even own a dog, but you know, the, 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 the list of things that we don't do and the list of things that we do you know, as I read my Bible, you know, five chapters a day keeps the devil away. Uh, you know, that I, I tithe regularly, I'm part of a gathering, I go on an outreach, I do, and I do, and I, you know, and I fast once in a while. All these things becomes a list. But Jesus said right at the top of this, he said, my command is this, love each other as I loved you. And of course, Jesus encapsulated all the law and the prophets in one statement when he was asked what the greatest command was. He said, well, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, the second command is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, this is my command that you love one another. So when I think about if you do what I command, I just want to remind us. In Ephesians 2, Paul wrote this. He said, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, and I'm still a King James guy deep down, his workmanship, right? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Dylan said this, I'm gonna quote, quote Dylan on this one. He said this, this is the great paradox, Our salvation is a gift of grace through faith, not by works, but this concept of friendship with God does involve our response. And I went, Dylan is right. Dylan is right. But it's not working my way into heaven. It's not, it's not, uh, you know, earning anything because I really believe God loves me on my best day and my worst day exactly the same. It's not, like, it's not like there's this little stock market thing with my name on it in heaven. Oh, Scott's doing good. His stock went up. Oh, Scott really blew it right there. Ooh, his stock plummeted. Oh, you know, that he just loves us. And our sin is, is covered by his blood. It's, it's taken away from us. Isn't that incredible? 
But in that, it's easy then to just go, eh, well, you know, God will love me. I can go do this thing and God will forgive me and it's all good. That's the tension. At least it is for me. Maybe not for you. So, so today, it's funny because when we were doing our little meeting as we were getting started and we took communion together and uh, we were going through the flow of the service, who's leading what songs and, who, and what I'm going to do for communion. And uh, it, uh, Alex gets to the party, he goes, okay, Scott, so then the video will end and you come out and, and what are you talking about? And I said, I'm going to talk about Judas. And he goes, yeah, tell me more about that. <laughs> Friendship with God, how does that, like, how, you think, how does that fit? Well, we all know Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus, right? Um, but what really, what, what really led me down this path to talk about Judas is, I'll, I'll, let's read this together, uh, in Matthew 26. Of course, they have communion together, just like, we took communion, and then uh, it's funny because Jesus says, well, somebody's going to betray me, and Judas reaches in the same time as Jesus, and Jesus said, it's the person whose hand dips into the, the bread the same time as me, and then he tells Judas what you do, do it quickly. And Ju of course, J Judas then leaves and goes off to betray Jesus. So it says this, while he was still speaking... Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd of uh, crowd armed with swords and clubs. Can you imagine this? Ah, right? Here they come. They're coming to get Jesus. Sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, catch this. The betrayer, Judas, had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Is that incredible? I mean, the weight of that statement. You could read that a lot of different ways. You could try and read into, into it with different inflections. Hey, do what you came for, friend. I think Jesus was crushed, even though he knew that Judas was destined for this moment, I still think Jesus was crushed, and I'm going to explain that. Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. So the question I ask is, why would Jesus choose a disciple who was going to betray him? And again, you can make a case, well, it was destiny, it was, spoken, you know, it was prophetic, and all that, and he had to do it, and I, I get all that. But to allow somebody into your, into your group like that for three years, knowing that they're going to betray you, you know what that tells me? God gives every one of us a chance. Every one of us. There's a place for everyone in the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 11, when I think about this, why would Jesus allow Judas as part of his group? Matthew 11 says this. I think this explains it. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. To me, that's kind of the explanation of it. It's really interesting because there's no mention of how Judas was called. If I mention Peter, you probably know Jesus, uh, Peter's fishing. Jesus says, hey, have you caught anything? Throw your nets out. And Peter's like, look, man, we've fished all night. <laughs> I'm a fisherman. I know you're Jesus. You know, I know who you are. And it's interesting that he goes, we fished all night, we haven't caught anything, but because you said so, I'm gonna let it, let it down. Of course, and then he catches all these fish. And you know Peter's response? He, it's easy to just go, well, he dropped, every, he dropped his nets and followed Jesus, but before that, he dropped to his knees. And he said, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. <laughs> That's Peter. That's how Peter was called. Judas was the only one of the 12 who was not 
Galilean. He, he was Judean. So yeah, I, how, how many of you remember the high school rivalries that you used to have? I grew up in the booming metropolis of Eaton, out in Preble County. And, you know, we had Twin Valley South and Twin Valley North, and we had National Trail, and we had Preble Shawnee, and our arch rival in cross country was Brookville in the next county over. And I just wonder, you know, him being like from another place, if he always felt maybe just a little bit like an outsider. Just, just wondering. So when, when Judas betrays Jesus and Jesus said, do what you came for, friend. I started looking at those, at the different words that mean friend. Because, you know, I can call you a friend. Hey, friend, how you doing? Uh, hey, we might say, hey, buddy, how's it going? Or what's up, dude? Whatever, you know. But when they say friend in the Bible, when he said, do what you came for, friend, it's, it's a Greek word, hetithras. And it actually means, uh, it's a kindly address. He's a familiar friend, okay? It wasn't like, hey, buddy, do what you came for. It was, hey, friend. But in John 15, when he said, you are my friends, and the verse that says Jesus was a friend to tax collectors and sinners, it's a different word. Philos. You might know phileo, right? The city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, comes from that word. And it, it's, it's a dear friend. There's a, a fondness. And it's interesting, if you, if you look this up, if you ever go to Blue Letter Bible, it's great. You can look up all these words, and, and it will say them for you. That's how I know how to pronounce those. Philos. Philos. Okay, I can say it on Sunday correctly. Caleb would be proud. Um, but it actually means there's a distinction between those two words, and the distinction is that uh, you are my friends, and he's a friend to tax collectors and sinners. It's a close friend, like the best man at your wedding. So Jesus is a friend to tax collectors and sinners like the best man. You know the best man's role is to just keep the other guys in line, hopefully, right? He's, he's the friend, I call on you, hey, can you run and go get this, I need this. There's a closeness that's there. So Jesus is that, and that's what he wants from us. He wants to be our friend. I had a, a friend of mine who told me, well, when I, was, I ran for office, I've run for office twice, and I ran three years ago now. That's why I went to truck driving school. I was so just over everything. I'm, I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to move trailers from point A to point B. And I did. And when you think about betrayal, how many of you have ever been stabbed in the back by somebody close to you? It's not fun, right? There's there's a part of you that just kind of sinks when you realize what they had done. Maybe they come to you, maybe you go to them, maybe they're contrite and they apologize. Sometimes that doesn't, you don't get that. I'm gonna share something with you, I did not get that. Somebody that was close to me on my campaign worked against me every step along the way and lied about it to the people that were important for their own, for their own good. And I mean, the things they said about me were just, just outrageous, you know. I was on the board of the NAACP, and they said that I was racist. Not the NAACP, but this person was saying it. All this kind of crazy stuff. They tried to get me kicked off that board. I mean, it was just insane. And uh, a prominent person who's involved kind of in politics in Dayton called me and asked me about this person, and I said, they are not supporting me. They are working against me in every way. Well, that's not what they told me. And I said, ask them how many doors they've knocked on. Ask them if they wrote me a check. Ask them how many signatures they got for me. Ask them that question. <laughs> because they didn't do any of it. And they were working against me, undercutting me. Another person that I considered a friend uh, I found out they were, connect they were collecting signatures, but not for me, for my running mate and one of our opponents. Now, we all knew each other. I knew all my opponents, right? It's like in an election, you see a dozen Republicans, a, do a dozen Democrats, 
most of them know each other. They have history. Most of them like each other. They may have policy differences, but you know, a lot of that on stage is show, and then they all get appointed to other positions <laughs> when that person gets elected. That's just kind of how it works. But I found out this guy was not collecting signatures for me, and I was crushed. I felt, I felt betrayed. Like he said he was gonna, he was gonna support me. Well, it doesn't mean he's gonna get signatures. Well, what does support mean? Oh, I'll pray for you, brother. Oh, great, thanks. I need your signatures. I need you to write me a check. Pray for me and write a check. Pray for me and knock on some doors, right? And Stacy, uh, Stacy Benson, shout out to Stacy, who also ran for city commission. Uh, we were a team. And she said, you know what your problem is, Scott? And I go, well, I got a lot of them. Tell me, what, my, what is my problem? And she goes, your definition of friendship. And I went, ah. And you know, that was four years ago. And I've never forgotten that. My definition of friendship she goes, you think because you sat on a board with somebody and you're familiar with them and you see them out in public and they chat with you and, or whatever, that they're your friend. They're not your friend. They're a, a, co a board member. They're a colleague. And I went, oh, wow, man, you, you are so right. <laughs> that was tough for me. You know, I have 4,700 really close Facebook friends, though. <laughs> I mean... People always walk up to me, oh, I see you know so-and-so. I go, who? So-and-so. I, I don't recognize that name. Well, you're friends with them on Facebook, and that's when I go, yeah, I have 4,700 really close friends on Facebook. And then I'll look, and I go, oh, okay, I was in a meeting with them one time, back, and they're, it's just, it's a connection. Inevitably, on my birthday, my wall on my Facebook page uh, I'll get 400, maybe 500 people that wish me a happy birthday, which is more than most people have in terms of friends on Facebook, right? And they go, wow, you had 457 people wish you a happy birthday. And I go, you know what that tells me? And they go, what? And I go, 4,200 people didn't bother to wish me a happy birthday because that's less than 10%. And they go, well, you're looking at it wrong. And I go, well, you know, I'm just saying, right? So this whole idea of friendship really hits me in a, in a deep, deep place. And especially I think the older I get is I really value, value friendships and relationships maybe more than I ever used to. I want to go back and just look at Judas just a little bit. Y'all know the story of, of Mary and she breaks open the, the we sang Alabaster Heart, she broke, in, broke open the, the jar of uh, it was alabaster, and it had the perfume, and it was worth a year's wages and all that. Judas was there when that happened. Not all the Gospels name him by name, but in the Gospel of John, it names him. It says, but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him. Isn't it interesting? He always gets that little tagline. Judas, who was later to betray him, objected. And it just sounds so smug. It, a sincere question is, hey, Jesus, wouldn't it have been a better use of money for this? But it seems more like, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It sounds so pious, right, in my head. He says, it was worth a year's wages. And it says this, this little bit of commentary. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself <laughs> to what was put in it. So Jesus allows a guy who's a thief to be his accountant. Again, I think giving him a chance to prove himself. If you're faithful in the small things, I'll make you faithful over big things, or faithful in a few things, I'll make you faithful over many. Matthew 26, it says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What would you be willing to give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Anyone want to take a guess at how much 30 pieces of silver would be worth today? Or what it was worth then? $91 to $400. That's what, that was his price to betray Jesus. And of course, that 30 pieces of silver was uh, spoken prophetically out of Zechariah. 
um, says this, then what was spoken by, it says Jeremiah, but it just means the prophets. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used him to buy the potter's field as the Lord had commanded. I mean, this was, this was a, a, a fulfillment of a prophetic uh, passage out of the Old Testament. And it just, uh, you know, the thing you have to wrestle with is, did Judas have a choice? Because uh, you know, you know that it was written, it's spoken prophetically, and he's the guy, and it says Satan had filled his heart, and he walked, but I go, man, he still made his choices. Could he not have? I, that's, that's the tough thing, is that ultimately I think God knew that he was going to make the wrong choice. You know, in the book of Deuteronomy, 30 pieces of silver was the value of a slave. Interesting, right? If something happened, my ox killed your slave, I owed you 30 pieces of silver. That says a lot. Matthew 27, look at this with me. It says, early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who what? who had betrayed him, there it is again, this is Matthew, not John, Judas, who betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse, and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, and what did he say? I've sinned. So the guy had remorse, and he knew he had blown it. He said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. You know what they said? It's up to us. It's your responsibility. In other words, it's on you. It's on you. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then the really tragic part, he went away and hanged himself. So sad. I just want to, if you're taking notes, these two verses didn't make the director's cut, so they're not on the website, but they're in my notes, Psalm 41 and Psalm 55. Because when I think about Judas, and I wonder how close he really was to Jesus, Psalm 41 says this. This is, again, a prophetic passage about the Messiah being betrayed. It says this, even my close friend, someone I trusted who shared my bread, that says a lot, doesn't it? Shared my bread, communion, has turned against me. The psalmist saw into the future what was going to take place. Psalm 55, it's also a psalm of David, carries a, a messianic prophetic perspective, uh, uh, perspective. It says this, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising up against me, I could hide, like I'd see it coming. I would have seen it coming. Of course, Jesus did see it coming and, and stated uh, stated that while he was celebrating the Passover, the one who dips his hand into the bowl with me. But it ends with this. But it's you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God. I think Jesus was closer to Judas than we might have thought. Like he was just some guy, you let him hang around until he would betray him. I think Jesus gave him every opportunity. When Alex said, what, explain to me about this. Well, when we, how does this tie into friendship with God? It's easy for me to put myself in this story. Can you? Like I'd like to think, I'd like to think that I wouldn't betray him. Or, you know, like Peter, that I wouldn't deny him but I'm sure I have at times. Times I could have spoken up and I didn't or, or whatever. Now I want to compare how Peter responded versus how Judas responded. You know, we know that Jesus called Peter and he said, you know, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Remember that growing up? I will make you fishers of men. You follow me. I wasn't here when Caleb, he, he did the father Abraham, right? He says, Scott was here. He would have done the whole thing. There's my chance to redeem myself right there. 
So when, when Peter was called, of course, he fell down at, his, at Jesus' feet on his knees, and he said, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. In John chapter 6, Jesus is talking, and the crowd uh, disperses, and he says, you don't want to leave me too, do you? He asked the 12. They were all there. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now catch this. He says, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Caleb talked about this, the difference in our, in our head and our heart. We can sort of know things, but have you experienced things? You can tell me God is good, but I've experienced God's goodness in the midst of the hardest circumstances. I just trust that he's still good and I'm looking for what he's doing. Peter said, we've come to believe and to know. And I go, well, did, you, did Judas only believe or did he not know? Now, again, when Jesus is telling the disciples what he, what's going to transpire, he says, look, I'm going to be handed over and be crucified. And Peter says, uh-uh, this is not going to happen. We're not going to let this happen, Jesus. Like, he's going to step in. And he did. When, when the crowd showed up, he had a sword, and it said he cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. <laughs> Whoop, and he cut off his ear. You know, imagine Jesus picking up. What are you doing, Peter? He picks it up, puts it back on. I mean... This is like a Monty Python skit, right? But Jesus then confronts Peter about this. And he says, get behind me, Satan. To Peter. He says, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Like, you have no idea what you're talking about. I can so see myself doing things like this. Just when you're an extrovert and you talk before you think... You don't know how careful I'm being throughout a whole message. I go, yeah, I, I don't want to say that. Yeah, I don't want to say that. No, I probably shouldn't say that. I could, eh, mm, that's all going through my head every step along the way. Can I joke about this? Probably shouldn't. So then Jesus is arrested, and Peter's following along. He's denied him twice and says this about an hour later. Another person asserted, certainly, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And then what? He went outside and wept bitter, bitterly. It's nearly the same language as the regret that Judas had. But the two different responses, Judas had so much regret at what he had done. And you could say, well, it's a much bigger offense and he handed him over. I get that. But they both had the same response at that point. They both had remorse. And it says he went outside and he wept bitterly. But the difference was Peter stayed connected. He stayed with his friends. He drew close. And of course, the passage that we all know that Jesus, he reconnects with Peter. Peter has kind of gone back to his life. He's fishing. Jesus is on the shore. Again, he yells out to the guys, hey, have you caught anything? Let your nets down. And John goes, hey, Peter, that's Jesus. And Peter jumps out of the boat and runs to Jesus. And I, I love it. Jesus already has fish cooking. Although I'm not crazy about the idea of fish at breakfast. Are you? Nah, it doesn't really, but okay. But here, Jesus, who had been crucified, they saw him, right? He's buried, and now he's raised from the dead, and he appears, and he's cooking him breakfast. I love that. I just think it's great. And, and so they eat together, and then, of course, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And then the third time, because he denied him three times, he says, do you love me? And he used agape, you know agape love, right? Unconditional love. The first two times and the third one, he went with the brotherly love. But do you, do you love me? Do you phileo me? He said, you know that I do. And then, of course, Jesus said, feed my sheep. That's a great lesson for all of us right there. I don't know if you can relate to Peter, but I, I've 
I relate to him really, really well. He's the one, Peter, James, and John, they go up the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Jesus has a meeting with Moses and Elijah. They appear, and Peter's losing his mind. I should build you a, a tent, a, something, right? And he just, Peter had foot and mouth disease. He just, and I relate to that. He just was Peter. He's just human. And all these people that we're talking about in, in all the, the, the series, all the different installments are all about Peter, are all about, you know, people like Peter, David, who was imperfect, had his great moments and had his low points, and yet they still continued to press in. What does that mean? God, he, there's room for each one of us in all of our imperfections. And you know, when I realized that, that I'm not as great as I might think I am, and then when I'm with people that don't know the Lord, I love hanging out with people. Ministry for me now looks like I'm taking a break from moving trailers around. I work at Abbott up in Tip City. I move trailers back and forth between their plant, and I drive nights so I can be here. And I sit down in the break room. I'm wearing my yellow safety vest and my badge, you know, and I'm sitting with a forklift driver who starts pouring his heart out to me who has no idea who he's talking to. I'm just a shuttle driver. Shuttle driver, can you give me a bump back on North 10, please? Yeah, copy. Be right there. That's, that's my life in a nutshell right there. I'm sitting with this forklift driver who's pouring his heart out to me about how his wife is so upset with him because he, he works, he's a forklift driver, and then he has a side job, and he's doing all this, and they have a couple of kids, and he likes to go hunting and whatnot. And I go, well, when was the last time you took your wife out to dinner? And he went, I don't, I don't even know. I go, maybe that's the problem. Maybe consider asking her out on a date. You know a place she likes to go? Oh, yeah, I know a place she likes to go. Yeah, well, why don't you just say, hey, I'm going to take next weekend off and I'm going to go out on a date. A couple weeks later, you know what I get? I get a text from him. Pictures of his meal. I go, he has no idea he's been catfished. <laughs> Stealth pastor. See, people don't need to know that you're a Christian. Just be a Christian. Be generous. Be kind to people. Love people right where they're at. Man, if you heard the conversations, working at a plant is very different than being a pastor at a church. I've learned a lot of phrases I've never heard before. Except maybe in movies, you know, episode of Ozark or something crazy like that. Where you, whoa, people really talk like that? <sighs> so what does this mean to us? I mean, I'm going to land this plane. One point, Jesus, it says Jesus noticed how guests were picking places of honor at a, at a dinner party that he was going to. And it says he told them, told his disciples this parable. He said, this is out of Luke 14. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say, hey, Scott, you need to just give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place. Take the one in the corner behind the pool, buy the food that nobody wants to sit at, right? And when the host comes to you, he'll say, friend, hey, come with me. I got a better spot for you. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. Now catch this. This phrase, this verse is quoted so many times. It says, for the, all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted, my brother-in-law Dave and I went to Rwanda. It's been, I don't know, almost 20 years ago now, maybe more than 20 years. And I was doing seminars there and whatnot. Um, and the, there was a group of Canadians that were the keynote speakers at this conference. And uh, I got shushed one night. 
<laughs> I know that's probably shocking. So I'm with my brother-in-law. We're just hamming it up outside of our little place that we were staying. I was in this compound, you know, block, little block house with a single bed and a, and a hose, basically, to wash up. And, uh, and we were being too loud. By we, I mean I was being too loud. And she came over. Her name was Elise, and she goes, shh, the Canadians are sleeping. <laughs> and so that became a running joke with my brother-in-law. Shh, like we see each other, we pass. Shh, the Canadians are speaking. They're, they're trying to sleep. Shh. In other words, I was put in my place, right? When we, we went to, uh, we were invited to a dinner with the ambassador. Doesn't that sound so, ooh, well, you got to have dinner with the ambassador. You know where we were seated? Out on the patio with the servants. There was a fish that was this long in the middle of this big table. And my brother and I were out, brother -in -law and I were out in the lobby. That's where we were, we were seated. This whole idea of taking the low seat, when I was running for office, I would do that. I would just take the low seat. I would sit in the back. I would, you know, I didn't hog the spotlight. I just tried to, I tried to live this out as best as I knew how. So here's the, here's the deal. If you're a fill-in type person, I'm going to give you these. Take the low seat in life. At work, as much as you might want to be self-promoting, take the low seat because humility is a choice. I know people that are, that are humble, I think, by nature. I'm not humble by nature. I'm really, I mean, most of us, I don't, I don't, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the only one who's not humble by nature. But I just think humility is a choice because that scripture says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So here's the point. Friends of God, choose humility. If you're going to be God's friend, you have to live a life walking in humility. And what happens then? What is the result? That friends of God, we receive favor and we receive grace. I walk in a lot of favor. I have people I can call, you know, it's pretty amazing. When the tornadoes hit Dayton, I was the first to, to reach out to the mayor of Dayton. And I was like, hey, have you seen what's happened here? All, the only thing they're reporting in the media is what happened way up north. But I said, I was just north of downtown, and it's destroyed. Have you seen this? I sent her pictures because I went there to see because we live a mile from there. And it was destroyed. Houses were moved off their foundations and all kinds, I mean, just leveled. And you know what she did? And she sent my pictures to the governor of Ohio. How about that? Like, Scott Sliver, on the scene reporter, <laughs> secret pastor, pulling the strings behind, you know. You know what? I love that kind of stuff. I'm very proud of that. I think we, that should be for all of us. You know, we just want to serve. I'm like just making them aware, hey, you know, this is, this is worse than they're reporting on, the t on TV at this point. Okay, I want to give you just a couple of closing verses. Because I always go, so what? what? What does this mean to me? Yeah, I walk in humility. Okay, I get that. But here's the thing. When we do something like, let's say Peter. Take Judas out of this part. It's walking, pressing in. Friends of God, we press in. When we blow it, we don't hide. We don't run. We don't beat ourselves up. We press in. What does that mean? That I, I stay close to people. I don't leave my gathering. I don't not come to church because I am embarrassed by something I had done or said or whatever that you, you press in. I mean, Jesus, even on the cross, he's hanging there and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you believe that? And then I go, did God forgive them? I thought I had to ask for forgiveness. Don't think too much about that. It'll keep you up at night. Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. He's, he's interceding for people. Like Peter. In 1 John 2, it says this. My dear children, I write this to you. This is John. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. The righteous one. An advocate is one who pleads our case. 
Wait, Jesus is advoc advocating for me <laughs> after I did that? Yeah. And how about this out of, out of uh, Timothy? First Timothy. If we disown him, now he's strong, he will disown us. Yeah, that's like that if. But if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. Why? He cannot disown himself. God is faithful even when you and I are faithless. Isn't that amazing? That's the good news. That's the gospel encapsulated in one statement. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. Even when we blow it. I hope, this is my secret hope for this, is that this changes how we look at the people around us. The people who are broken, the people who are hurting, the people who have stabbed you in the back, the people who have, you know, the people who don't know the Lord, that we remind ourselves that Jesus is our friend when he doesn't have to be. He's our friend, and he's a friend to tax collectors and sinners, just like us, just like those, those people, whoever they are. The person that just grates on your nerves that you just don't like, that's hurt you, that he loves them too, and he's still being faithful to them. And that's our opportunity to serve them and to love them. Let's stand together. You know, I went back, I went back and, and I searched uh, Billy Graham Sinner's Prayer. And he, he actually put his prayer in a book called uh, Billy Graham, The Heaven Answer Book. And this is, this is the prayer that he always prayed with people at the end of one of his big conferences, big outreach evangelistic meetings that he would do, at like a stadium with 20,000 people there. Oh God, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins and I want to turn from them. I trust Christ alone as my savior and I confess him as my Lord. From this moment on, I want to serve him and follow him in the fellowship of his church. And then he said, in Christ's name, I pray, amen. To which I go, Billy left one thing out there. I want to serve him and follow him in the fellowship of the church. And I would add, Jesus, I want to know you as my friend. Because he said, I no longer call you servants. Servant doesn't know this master's business. I call you friends. Lord, Savior, and friend. Isn't that great news? Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that you're a friend to each one of us. That you love us when we deserve it the least. Thank you that you give all of us the same chance to come clean with you, to draw close to you, to ask for forgiveness when we've blown it, to step into the plan that you have for each one of us. We thank you for that, Lord. If you've never prayed that, that prayer, that Billy Graham-ish prayer that I, that I read to you, if that resonated with you, you may have never prayed it before, if that resonated with you, I'd like for you to come up at the end of the service here. We'll have our, our uh, prayer team will be here and just let somebody know that you prayed that. And I say, welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to a new relationship with Christ where he wants to be your friend. He wants to walk alongside you to lead you in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word, Lord, that's just so encouraging. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.